the weekend tournaments or disappearing off to Ireland for a week to go play a big tournament, those, those require a little bit more negotiation. <laughs> This is 5 to 9, a podcast where we discover the hidden passions and hobbies that engineering, product, and technology leaders obsess over when the workday happens. Hey, John. Thanks for coming. Um, super excited to have you here. Um, for all the folks here, though, um, in, in this kind of beautiful weather we're both in today, uh, who are you? Who's John Palmer? Yeah, I'm John Palmer. Uh, I'm here in the Boston area, uh, and uh, today for work, I'm lead developer experience for Fidelity. Uh, before Fidelity, I was uh, leading engineering teams at a bunch of Boston-based startups. And you've got that really nice Brit accent that we all wish we had. <laughs> it's all softer than it used to be and confuses people sometimes when I tell them I'm originally from the UK. But uh, my 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 siblings and my parents have done a better job of, uh, of, of retaining the accent. <laughs> yeah. When you when you go back to the UK, do they give you crap that you sound American? Absolutely, and you know my friends there can't believe uh, these these kids that I have who have these you know clearly only American accents. They think that's very funny. I'm different. I sound very different than I did when I was hanging out with them in college twenty years ago. <laughs> true, true, true. So we're here today actually talking about what I think is a cool sport that we play. But I'm going to judge you because like we're both in our forties. I can't believe we still do this, and and you're like a like a ultimate frisbee, like a, you still travel, you go to tournaments and do all this stuff. So, or like I got to play a little bit in college, so I know what it is, but like, let's refresh it. Like what is ultimate frisbee or ultimate? Sorry, I'm, I'm actually doing it wrong. Like oh, ultimate frisbee, right? That's kind of like a, it's ultimate. Yeah, that's right. right. Like, One of those words is trademarked. And so we don't get to use it that way, uh, at least in the official things. That's why it's got a weird name that nobody gets. Um, yeah, no, I mean, ultimate I, I, I started playing it in college, um, game that was sort of invented in the seventies, uh, on the, in, in the new England area. And I was fortunate to sort of be part of it growing pretty significantly in the UK. I mean, at its, at its core, that's a pretty simple game, right? You seven folks aside, uh, you need a field with end zones by roughly the size of a football field, a little narrower than that. You can't run with the Frisbee. You got to score by catching it in the end zone. Like that's the basic mechanic. I have to say it, it's such a good uh, engineer's nerd sport in the sense that it is athletic, it's team oriented, but there is no contact, right? It's this thing where you can't like touch each other. There's no push in the none of these things. Yeah? Correct. At, at, at its unique aspect is that it's uh, self refereed right? Even at the very highest level, right? So the rules are set up such that if you've got resolve the dispute, you're going to send the throw back, you're going to do it again. And, uh, and it's, remarkable that it could be played at the highest level and that mostly isn't uh isn't a challenge <laughs> i'm gonna drop some jargon here to pretend i know what i'm talking about like words that i should know right like laying out and the hammer right those are two things that people said that's right laying out so you know throwing your body on the ground to uh to make the catch like you probably don't want to be doing it that's in general that's a sign that the throw did the thrower did the wrong thing and the receiver had to had to rescue them you're on defense and you're making a heroic play that you've got to throw your body in the air and then hit the ground to get the interception. That that's a that's a better outcome. Yeah, hammers are uh, sort of the first trick throw. I think their folks learn right. Most folks learn how to throw a backhand, throwing it on the forehand. You learn and then hammer is an upside down throw that you know can you can throw over a whole bunch of people. So. Uh, a useful skill. Yeah, you turn the frisbee upside There's, down, right? And then it kind of like, you throw it up high. That's right. So you're throwing it upside down rather than right side up. But that means that, you know, you could throw it high and arcing and yeah. And, and that, aerodynamically it drops, right? It's like, correct. Oof. So, you know, that, that and allows you to really change field position, uh, uh, you know, throw against the wind in different ways, uh, you know, take advantage of where the defense isn't to put it into a space that only your receiver can get to. Yeah. For folks that don't, it's, it's like American football, except of a, instead of a ball, you're throwing a frisbee and you can't run and there's no contact. I think that's roughly right. It's sort of, uh, <laughs> or more like actually more like basketball because it's always moving, right? There's not this concept of downs, right? Like that's right. You, you've sort of basketball, but you're throwing throws to wide receivers covered by quarterbacks, kind of a thing. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So somewhere in between. Yeah. Higher width of this pitch, Kaplan looks to the end zone and has Palmer there. Finally, Molasses get another hold. That was 
A little bit of a slog. Gore, let's have another look at the way they set this up. Beautiful swing around to Ferguson. And such a gainer. And that's something that you don't always see at the end of a swing. The whole point of moving it across the pitch is so the defense gets stuck on the opposite sideline. And you open yourselves up for a massive gainer. I mean, I called you on this because I, I was remembering I saw you on Facebook and you're still going to like traveling tournaments. And I'm going to call you out like you're in your 40s and the rest of us don't do anything besides like cycling stationary bikes or like some light running now. Everybody else I know that does these lateral sports have blown out their knees. Like they, you know, very people I know still do, you know, travel soccer or travel ultimate, those kind of things. You still do it, right? Yeah, I think uh, I've been lucky, right? Uh, I have plenty of teammates who have blown out those things and who are still playing. Uh, rarely are they, you know, career ending. I do it because it keeps me fit. I love the community. Um, my wife is wondering the same things. When might I hang up my cleats and stop playing? I think I'd be a lot harder to live with if I didn't have ultimate in my life. Definitionally, do you play for a club team or travel team? What, what do you call it? Uh, yeah, a combination. Um, so uh, there are what we call in Boston the Summer Club League, and that plays from sort of May through September once or twice a week. Um, we tend to have a home field where we have the permit on a Thursday night. We travel to other folks on a Tuesday. There's a uh, Boston organization that sort of schedules all that stuff. So that's the summer league, more recreational group of folks that I've been playing with for a decade or more. Still high standard, lots of good players, but it's but it's casual. Uh, and then I, at the moment, play on a on a club team in the Grand Masters division, and we're competing at U.S. Nationals and Worlds, uh, which we've done both those in the last two years, and that's the. You know, that's the high level stuff that we mix. And many people do exactly that. We're lucky in Boston that there's such a great kind of casual club scene. And then a lot a lot of folks are playing on those two teams that whatever the age group is appropriate to them. <laughs> What's your team name, your, your, your club team? Yeah, the club team is called Molasses Disaster. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, we're from Boston and we are slow and sticky at the eggs that we play at. <laughs> and that's what Masters means. Masters is 35 plus, 40 plus? What is it? What is it? So Masters is 33 plus for men and 30 for women. And then Grand Masters okay. is 40 plus and 37. There is a great Grand Masters level and there, there's an emerging legends level. They're calling it for 60 plus. And believe it or not, like okay. there are real competitive games played by those folks. And if, if I'm lucky enough to still be playing at that age, I'll be very happy. So I wanted to get back into this after not playing for like it. And by the way, this is this actually have it, but I wanted it. I clearly can't enjoy molasses after, but I just want to kind of get into this thing again. Like after 20 years, like, well, what, what would I do? Do I just like go to a website? Do I just show them a field? Like what's, what's it like? Yeah. In Boston, you'd go to, uh, Boston ultimate disc Alliance. Uh, so that's yeah. Buddha.org as a good nerdy acronym. Um, and I think the entry place for that would be, they run in addition to these club leagues where folks are putting their teams together, they run a bunch of hat leagues. So you sign up, you tell them roughly what your experience is, and then they're going to uh, put together some teams with some experienced captains, and they'll play once or twice a week. Um, and that's that's a great way to get back into it as a or get into it as a first place. There's complete beginners on those teams, all that stuff. It's it's a great way to start. You call it a hat league? Is that is that proverbially like they have a hat, a bunch of names in there? They juggle it around. It? Yeah, normally because you're picking teams from a hat, like it's all on a computer these days. But yeah, that's 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 the normal culture. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's, it's a Google Docs they call it a Google Sheets called the hat, right? That yeah, has like a random right. algorithm. Yeah. Okay. Well, so talking about getting started, like, so what do you like? What do you need to get started? Like, you know, there's all these gear driven sports like biking and skiing, all this stuff, but like. What do you need to play ultimate? I just want to get my, you know, our, our five friends together, or whatever, you know, 10 friends together. Like, what do I need? What do you do to get started? Yeah, it's pretty easy. Um, you know, you need a, you need a field, soccer field, American football field, something, and you're going to take up a chunk of it. You probably need some cones to mark the end zone. So you need eight cones. You probably need at least five people aside at it, a Frisbee, single one. And it's much better if you're wearing cleats. Um, other than that, like there's not a lot of gear. Um, that's one of the things I okay. love about it. It's super easy for kids to get into, right? They can play at sneakers if they want to play a lot. They can buy a pair of cleats and they'll have a better time. But other than that, you okay. show up in a, you know, shorts and t-shirt or whatever the weather needs and you just play. There's like the standard Frisbee. Is that like the regulated thing you use or now are there like 
premium versions now where there's like alt brands that make like or or is the game defined by you have to get that one frisbee that's like the frisbee bad frisbee yeah there it it is regulated in the sense that we play also with a 175 gram disc there really is only one major manufacturer which is discraft and they make and it's the ultra star model they make lots of discs but they make the ultra star and that's what the tournaments all play with and there are, there are some other brands that make similarly shaped things, but they actually fly differently and it's a little bit of an adjustment to switch between them. So if you've thrown, you know, if you've done your 10,000 hours and you pick up another brand, you can tell immediately that it's different. So it tends to be, um, tends to be a, a, a Discraft Ultra Star 175. I'm surprised given all the sports that it hasn't elevated into some premium, premium brand. Like this is the $700 like disc kind of thing. You know, like all of the sports eventually find ways to like get you to, to pay more yeah I, I think there's just such a you know you need a price point about 10 15 dollars so that you can because you don't you know you don't use they get used up they get dinged up they get marked you want to play with something that's reasonably new and because it sucks you know like the the mechanics are throwing are different if the brand is different right the aerodynamics yeah. are different um and so it's an adjustment so uh the standardization that you're going to go to every tournament and you know they're going to provide discs at tournaments that are all made the same way um, is kind of important in disc golf where you get to go pick your stuff just like you can pick any number of clubs and and at golf balls and pick the thing that you want there's a ton of innovation and lots of different brands there but but in ultimate because you you know just need the standardization love it we'll, we'll talk about golf in a second here okay so the other thing i was asking when i was i was, I was ribbing you on on us being old folks here like sports like this but like other part is like how do you make life work right because look you know i know you've got kids you've got a partner you've got you know, big deal job. You've got all kinds of life obligation, family. Like, like you said, it keeps you sane early. But how do you like make it all work? It's a balance, like all of these things. When my kids really were little, I didn't play very much. I was uh, doing other things. I was pretending that I was being a triathlete because I could do those kinds of things while kids were napping. Right, I had an hour so I could go ride the bike, come back before everybody woke up. Uh, the idea when they were little of going away for a weekend tournament, let alone a week tournament, was just impractical. So I, I, I didn't ask. I knew what the answer was going to be, however hard I tried. Now that the kids are a little bit older, it's a bit easier. So like one of the dynamics is on a Thursday, kids come with me. And, you know, they eat dinner on the sideline. I'm playing. We've got dozens of kids on the sideline, so they're having a great time. So Thursday nights... I'm taking the kids at 5.30 and we don't come back until 8.39, 9.30 and oh, my partner gets the night off. And that makes it yeah. a little bit more palatable if on a Tuesday I disappear off and go play. I get that evening to myself. Um, and, and you know, I'm also, my kids are playing and so I go and coax them and we disappear for most of a Sunday. Oh, they're, play, they're playing all three right. too? So we disappear for most of a Sunday afternoon. So that gives my partner some time to go do whatever she'd like to do. And then, you know, the the weekend tournaments or disappearing off to Ireland for a week to go play a big tournament, those, those require a little bit more negotiation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and like, okay, so you got like, you know, this is summertime sounds like, but like, or at least the, the summer league. You've got like Tuesday playing, you got Thursday things, you got Sunday for the kids too, and you got the travel, you know, with you got attorney coming up. Like, do you like train too, or is the act of playing on Tuesday the training? Like, like you're not that guy. You should say you're a track before, but like, like do you do other things that like to, to like work, or is that the totality of it? Yeah, that, that's one of the things I like about uh, playing in Grand Masters is that we don't have official other things. If you're playing in the you know the most competitive stage where there is no age limits, those folks are off and they're playing. You know, if you're joining a college team, you're probably playing five or six times a week, right? If you want to play on a top club team these days, you're You've got midweek practice. You're playing your Tuesday and Thursday nights for folks. You're doing double weekend practice the whole time. In Masters and Grandmasters, we've got, got kids and other commitments. So we mostly trust folks to get their, themselves in shape and play. So that makes the family life piece easier. And yeah, I, I do do other things. I like to run and ride the bike and still do those things, kind of fit those in around work and family. Yeah, how do you squeeze those in? I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to squeeze them in. It's hard. I get worse at it every year. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, sometimes just get up early or um, or using my commute to work to ride the bike and do some of those kinds of things. My new thing is I will uh, 
try to incorporate a run and drop off kids. So I drop off kids twice from school. And um, someone put me out this a while ago, which was like, don't stress around like a mile or a, a day kind of thing. And then someone else put me on a, on a thing, which is like, keep your heart zone, like low. Right. right. So like try to keep it around like you know, 130 or whatever, 130, 140 kind of thing. And those two things have actually helped me kind of incorporate it. Right. Cause I could, like, I can just, you know, I don't have to shower beforehand. I get my running clothes on and walk, walk the kids to school, run from there at one mile and know with a heart rate. So I was turning it to two and or great. Like, you know, make it back home, shower there. You know, little things like that kind of work for me. I don't know. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and you know, hey, now that we're spending a more time in these hybrid work environments, it's easier to fit in the workouts when there's less commuting to do. So that that's where I've tended to find the time more recently is, is that. And then, yeah, try to do something that's a little bit more involved on the weekend. If I'm not playing Ultimate, you know, can I go to a slightly longer run or a bike ride or that kind of stuff? Yeah. And now the kids are older, sometimes they join in and that makes it more palatable for family like to do it, right? Let's just go do a bike ride with them and go do some fun stuff. Okay, so I heard a couple of geographies of you. You said earlier, you came up and actually seeing Ultimate in the UK. You said you're at the Boston, Rec League, all this stuff. You said you went to Ireland, the fraternity. Like, are there, is there like one set of rules for Ultimate or is this like a, like, are there quirks in different ways to do? Like, if I was, you know, if I was playing in Australia, would it be different if I was playing it like, you know, India, is there like a different variation of these things? So they're like, where's the game, the game? There's mostly two sets of rules that are very similar and getting closer. There's uh, the World Flying Disc Federation rules, so woof duff. Um, and that's what basically everybody, everybody plays under. And they have rules for other disc-related sports. Um, the U.S. has their own set of rules, which were inspired by that, adapted, and now they're bringing back in July. So... If you're playing, depending on who's organizing the tournament, um, you'll play by their rules. They're very similar. The U.S. ones have some interesting wrinkles. The rules on fouls and contact are a little bit more permissive. Um, so the bigger friction is uh, U.S. teams going to international tournaments and playing a little harder with a little more. A little, a little, a little too touchy. Yeah, yeah. So having to adjust, having to adjust your play style for those tournaments, which is what the U.S. teams will try to do. Um, is, is the biggest adjustment. So in the, in the spectrum though, it's still not like contact, like you're not like, but like what, what, what is permissive? Is it like, Hey, like any contact or like, you know, give, give me the variation with it actually. Yeah. So the variation really there is like one of the principles is the principle of verticality. So like if you're jumping straight up and somebody contacts you, like that's your airspace, that's a common cause of foul, but it is so I got my hand above you and you jump up into my hand It's my fault. That you fouled me. That's right. Now, most of the time, you actually got two folks jumping into the same space and, you know, banging shoulders or, 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 you know, who gets to the disc first. Like, that's typically not a foul, right? Other common kinds of contact, you know, like you're trying to catch it and, and somebody hits your arm because they're reaching, maybe they're laying out, they hit you and then you don't close, you know, uh, that, that's where the contact is. So it's, you know, like, Bumping heads, bumping shoulders. Maybe you've got two folks laying out and they end up landing on top of each other. Um, and one of the rules is that there's a dangerous play clause, right? So you have to be able to make the play in a reasonable way that's not going to injure the other person, right? So if I'm laying out and there's no way that I'm going to do it other than driving my shoulder through your hip, whether I get the frisbee first or not, if the contact was inevitable, I'm going to be heavy, then like I fouled you. And so, you know, you're expected to keep yourself and everybody else safe. So like in the, in the international one, some of that discretion there is no-no. Oh, that's right. And so, so the, the U S difference is that like, if the contact happened after the play was made, then it didn't matter if there was contact afterwards and, in the, oh. in the world rules, like, no, you can't say, but I created the interception. So it didn't matter that I hit you. If you were going to hit me anyway, whether before or after the interception, that it's still a foul. And it's interesting as a, as a spectator. I think the U.S. version makes more sense to people, especially if you're used to watching football or basketball where that kind yeah, of stuff yeah. is encouraged. It makes sense, right? Where the U.S., yeah. And, but you go watch the international rules, you're like, wait a minute, I don't understand. Like, the defensive player made an amazing athletic play. That was awesome. They should be on the highlight reels, and you're telling me it's a foul. So that's that's part of the dynamic. And so when you go to Ireland, was that international rules of play? Yeah, that was uh, that was the uh, club masters competition uh, that runs every uh, four years. I heard a piece of jargon I think I picked up on, maybe not, but you said, if you close, 
Did you just like, was that a, is that a Johnism, a Britishism, or is that an ultimate Frisbeeism? I think he was like, you were saying like, you actually got the disc or something like that. I don't know. Was that a jargon thing or did I just miss it? No, I didn't. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Okay. Charlie, well, like the it. principle there, like the way the rules are written is like, it's a catch once you've stopped the disc from spinning. Right. So if I'm, I'm closing my hand, but I haven't stopped the spin of the disc and somebody hits the Frisbee, then that, that, that's not a foul. That's, and it's not a catch. So that, so the, the, uh, the, the closing of possession is, is, is the key point there. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Yes. We're getting nerdy on the rules. Yeah. yeah okay. All right, like it's it's I'm learning on this stuff. So my Instagram feed now is for whatever reason, making some breath with you, has been uh fed with this stuff like disc golf. You said it earlier. Okay. So what is disc golf and why did it take off? And I like I think I know what's going on, but the, the discs look different, the whole thing is different, right? Yeah, so disc golf is really uh it's golf, but played with a disc rather than hitting a ball. Um and the the hole is actually a basket. They're about a foot and a half wide. Like, a, and they have like chains have on this chains thing. Because like that's what holds the disc in when you've made the shot. And you typically set up these courses. The municipalities love these things as a good, relatively cheap way to get their public spaces used. You don't need to interfere too much with the rest of the use. You typically put them in forests and other things. You clear the fairway. So there's a shot that you can reasonably make. And then the you need all, instead of different clubs in the game of golf, you have different Frisbees and different discs. And they, depending on the aerodynamics, they have very different flying properties, right? So you will, you throw it straight and it will, as it slows down, go right, or it will go left. And depending on the shape of the hole that you're playing, that's the advantage. You'll have things that travel further, but are much harder to control. So, you, you know, that's your driver. They'll throw them 200, 300 feet. The holes are measured in feet typically. You'll have different discs that are putters that are very stable that you couldn't throw very far, but you can throw very accurately when you're trying to make the shot. And so there's there's a lot of variety there. I, I I'm not an expert in this space, but I think if you're a pro, you're gonna carry a bag of twenty or more discs and you're gonna pick the right one for the shot that you have to make. Um it's great fun. Do you play? It's only you it's only you play, but you don't like do it a lot. I play a little, and as as I get older, I play more, which is an uh, uncommon progression. Um, and uh, and I had a huge explosion. What was interesting about that sport? Huge explosion in the pandemic, because you could go on your own and play still. Whereas you know you need other friends to play ultimate. You've got to be within three meters to play. Right, you're breathing on each other when you're marking them. Whereas diff golf, you could socially distance. Um, and go and do these things. So there was a huge, huge uptick in uh, disc golf uh, in the pandemic, and and they coincide with the organization of that team, uh, that organization, and them getting you know professional circuit. There are folks that professionally that make a career out of being disc golfers these days. Nobody's really a self-sustaining ultimate player. There are professional leagues that are trying to be there, but but they're not. It's not a salary that you can live off. But there are people that are living off playing disc golf. It's great. I was going to say, it sounds like there's no real pro pro where you don't do other jobs for Ultimate Frisbee, but there is, like you're saying, you could make a career just like this goal. Yeah, it's a pretty small what a weird, what slice a weird of the inversion, top. right? Yeah. I think it's yeah. pretty busy, right? Like you're playing a tournament every week. You're probably living out of your van, driving around. It's not a glamorous, like flying between things, but there are folks that are doing that and right, you know, some real sponsorship deals. I think there's sort of, you know, half million, million dollar sponsorship deals from the wow. disc manufacturers for the very top player. Like it's a thin slice. I'm not an expert on it, but like there are some folks doing that. Yeah. This was my theory around earlier around asking for it. There's premium things of, of like ultimate Frisbee you actually play with. And I, I think probably goes hand in hand because disc golf, you can get premium variations. You have to buy all this stuff, which thus creates the market. People will buy it. Plus you can sponsor people. Like it's that. That's right. Like that, there, there's a there's a business there, whereas it's hard to build a business for ultimate. Whereas ultimate, the businesses are around shirts, uniforms. There's a few folks doing cleats, but you know, because because there is a variety there, right? And you know, we're probably printing and making new shirts for every season and all that kind of stuff because different people are playing on different teams. But it's well, less around the less yeah. around the around the disc. You said disc golf really kind of popped up, really, or, or really picked up during the pandemic, but like. Is there judgment? Like, are you in the ultimate versus side and be like, well, the golf sides for old folks or, or is it like, 
or is it now just like the two things go in concert and like both build both things or like is there i think they're just think they're in concert um you know one's an individual sport the other's a team sport some people do both but they don't they don't compete and while they're both throwing a disc the techniques and skills are very different too, right? You have to be athletic to play disc golf, but it's not the same fitness that you would have to be able to yeah, play a like, weekend oh, tournament, yeah, right? Just, so it's a different kind of it, stuff. It's not timed, really. You're not like running between the, the like the, the shots, right? No. It's no. like golf, right? Like, yeah, okay. that's right. So you actually don't have to be like necessarily cardiovascular fit. Play. That's right. But, but it could be, but you don't have to be. That's right. Oh yeah, this is for me because we're here. Like, are there courses here where people play this? Uh, there's a surprising number of courses, yeah, um, and and in all kinds of weird and wonderful places. There's uh, there's some great apps and websites that list them out. Um, many are free. Um, you know, I go off and play. And, and but it requires more to get started, though, right? I have to buy the stack of discs. Yes, but you could probably buy two and get away with those things. On you know the equivalent of short. There, there's a, there are nine hole like par three disc golf courses oh, like, just like, like a, there like are a pit, like a pitch and putt kind of yeah thing. and so with with a putter and another disc you could be just fine right and yeah. and you know you're not going to go pick up a, a a disc driver and and throw it 300 feet however like on your first go they're really hard to throw an, uh, an ultimate disc is much easier to throw than a disc golf disc. Oh, interesting. The yeah. harder. Okay. Because they're, okay. they're, they're much more aerodynamic. They have way more lift. It sounds like both of these sports are like uh, kind of easy and accessible to get started, but hard to be like great at, hard to master. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. I think like many of these things, you know, you need your 10,000 hours, so to speak. I remember in college just, you know, I was playing two or three times a week, but in between class or whatever, like I just go out and with a buddy, we would just throw, right? How do I... How do I get the right arc on that throw? How you know I must have just thrown thousands of times most days, just working on that stuff, so that when you're in a game, you know you can do it instinctively and and yeah, so you can get out there, you can run around, you can play, you can. The tactics are simple, um, but to get really good, you just you've got to put in your time. How many hours have you put in? Are you at eight thousand now? Are we talking here? Oh, I hate to think it's it's crazy. Uh, so, uh, there's there's a bunch of pretty nerdy folks in the ultimate community in general, and, and one of my teammates when I try to do the analysis, like how many times have I thrown a frisbee, kind of a thing, right? You're like, okay, if warming up for every game, you're going to make 150 throws, and you do that, you know, seven times oh. a weekend, and you've been playing this sport for 20 years, and you've got practice, which has way more throws than games. Like the numbers are. I, I don't even know what yeah, they are. 10,000 like, 10, is easy then. If you do easily 10,000 like, yeah, is probably yeah. in the hundreds of thousands, yeah. if not like a million Frisbee throws in your career kind of a thing. Yeah. Like it's, it's, a, it's a big number. <laughs> Got it. Okay, so back to Ultimate here. Like it, it's a sport you clearly put in your life. Like which part of it do you enjoy the most? Why does it work for you? Not like you asked earlier, how does it work? But whoa, like what makes it, like what makes you tick up? I think it's, it's a simple game that takes a little while to master that's fun it's really interesting that you know everybody has to throw everybody has to catch everybody has to play offense everybody has to play defense and so you need this overall skill set and you specialize in different parts of that but everybody's got to be able to do it so it really is a sport that requires a team to do well right so what i enjoy most and especially the last couple of years because we would fortunate to be pretty successful is the team the community the sense of achievement when you play well because you needed everybody. It's you could have star players, but you know, they can't score every point, they can't make every throw. So you really have to play well. I love that it works really well as a mixed sport because that also changes the dynamic of the team. That's what I prefer to play. I think I just come back to it's the community, it's the team. You know, I I could have a really bad day at work and not really want to go to Ultimate and play that game at 6 30, but by the end of that game, like I've reset, I haven't thought about work. You know, I could just be me and play frisbee for a couple of hours, and and the my teammates will you know make sure that I have a better time than I did. And so like, yeah, that community and teamwork that brings you together just helps me reset my brain every time I play, and that that's what makes it work. Love it. Okay, so you use the word strategy broadly, and, and so like in the game of ultimate, like talk to me about you know. Position, strategy, like I kind of understand seven on seven, you're on a field, but like it's just like not everybody does everything or maybe they do like, but like, how do you even talk about 
strategy generally and, and like you know are there are there defenders offenders like how does it how does it work yeah so offensively it's you know all the strategies are really about the kinds of throws that you want where the space is on the field and so there are broadly speaking two strategies one where you line up the receivers in a line which we would call a stack down the field and that means that there's space either side right and so you're going to throw to the side of that stack people are going to make their cuts into those spaces you're probably oh, gonna... so everyone's like, oh, like in one line if i look That's down right. the field towards the end so everyone's in like one line and then when i get rid of the throw they break they kind of go yeah, in the opposite they're, direction. they're going to make fakes and then they're going to hit one of those open spaces and you're probably in that tactic you're you're looking to throw, you know, several 10 to 15 yard passes to advance the disc down the field and score. The other alternative is that actually you put three folks who we call handlers along the back where the frisbee is, or the other four players are downfield, probably 20 yards away. And that game is much more about making one or two throws and then throwing a big throw two thirds or half the length of the field, right? So the spaces are then right in front of the handlers or way deep. And so it's a different variety of throws. A, a really athletic team with tall receivers will like playing that horizontal offense. A team that's more squirrely with lots of great throws because you could, you know, put the disc into different positions will play more uh, vertical stack. Vertical stack's easier to teach because you don't need such big throws to make it work. Um, vertical stack will work better if the conditions are windy or rainy because the big throws are much riskier uh, if, if yeah. the wind could get underneath it. So... And sometimes it'll depend on, you know, the kind of defense that the, the defense is playing. Broadly, as a strategy for the defense, you're you're going to go play person on person where you're guarding against a player and you're going to pick which side of the field you're forcing to. So somebody's marking the thrower who has the disc. Most of the time, you're going to pick a side of the field to take away because you're physically standing there making those throws hard and force the throws to go to the other side. And then, and then defenses, especially in windy conditions, you could play various forms of zones where you're guarding an area and you're trying to force the team to make difficult throws into the wind or throw hammers over the top that, that they misread where the defense and the offense is. So depending on weather conditions and style, your fitness, uh, what the other team is good in, you're going to mix. The height. Yeah. Exactly, right? If you're playing zone, you're going to go put a six-foot something guy probably at the back so that they can, you know, play center field, so to speak, and catch any error throws. Uh, you're going to put, you know, players who are basically chasing the Frisbees that moves in small spaces. You're going to put your fast players who are who are good at that stuff on the front. How old is Ultimate Frisbee? Or how old is Ultimate? Ultimate, I uh, invented in the late 60s, early 70s. I think at I, uh, high school, somewhere in, I forget where that is. Um, Okay, there so you. like a 50, 60 year old sport, and there's yep. only two strategies people play. Pretty much. I'm being simplistic here. <laughs> like, you would think they meant more plays invented in this stuff. Yeah, right? there, uh, there's an emerging trend, uh, which is interesting in the last few years, which folks are calling hacks, where instead of those stack strategies, you're actually spreading the players out more based on a triangle offense from basketball, where yeah. you're actually just like, you're just moving the disc as quickly as possible. You don't care whether you're going backwards or forwards. You're just trying to take advantage of mismatches and get the defense out of position. And some teams, and I mean, it's more popular in other countries than than others. Are, are there's a little bit of evolution, but it's 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 not mainstream yet. Hex, I knew something new. I'm going to drop that as my <laughs> knowledge. I'm going to learn how to hack. All right. Well, hey, John, this has uh, like been awesome. So thank you for uh, sharing all of these things and being here. Um, like. Uh, us regular folk, like, how do I get into this? Like, are there, are there like, uh, you know, hit the YouTube books, podcasts, like, is there a live streamed ultimately? Like, how, how do I get into this? Yeah, that's, that's right. There's a few books that would be many re written recently. I mean, I'd encourage folks to go and find their local leagues. Most cities have something going on. Uh, USA ultimate is the governing body. Uh, in the U.S. and they can provide, they have links on their site to various, you know, member organizations. There's normally a pickup game or a hat league or something going on in most cities in the U.S. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff being streamed. The professional leagues are doing a really nice job with their media. Some of their games are on ESPN and other things like that. Every now and then they make top 10 plays. Um, some of the tournaments I've played in, in Ireland, the semifinal and final were streamed. You can go watch it on Ultimate if you want to watch a bunch. Oh, I'll let you find it. You can watch a bunch of 40 year olds running around there. And um, yeah, so there, there's quite a lot of material on YouTube. 
Um, there's lots of hard tutors of getting into it, but your best bet is just to go find a local crew. They're, the community is super welcoming of new players of any age, and they'll take you aside, teach you some throws, the details of basic strategy, and then go out and play for a couple hours and see how you like it. Love it. Love it. All right. Andrew Lau here. I hope you enjoy this episode of Five to Nine. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on our next episode. Who knows what hidden talents or hobbies we'll discover on the next episode of Five to Nine.